Okay, um, so uh, this is going to be more of an introductory session. I mean, I realize that not everyone knows about how Badger works. So this is more of a introductory session, right? So, um, so let's start with what is Badger DB, right? So, uh, Badger DB is an embeddable key value store. And as embeddable, I mean you don't need a server to run it. You import it in your code, and that's all you have to do. You have your get set APIs, and they work. You don't need a server for that. Um, it's written purely in Go. It was built as a alternative to RocksDB. RocksDB is written in C++ and it's kind of difficult to use C++ coding code. So BadgerDB was written, built for that reason. Um, Badger is also crash resilient. What I mean by crash resilient is you do a transaction, you do a commit, and even up if, if your machine crashes after that commit, your data won't be lost. We have a write ahead log wherein we store all the entries. So even if your machine crashes after the commit, you have you don't lose any data. Um, we support separation of keys and values. So uh, in a typical LSM tree, so LSM tree is a data structure which Badger uses store stuff in which uh, in that structure you have keys and values. So what Badger supports is you don't need to, you don't necessarily have to store all the values in the tree as well. I'll show this in the next slides. Why is that? But um, if your values are bigger, it just becomes expensive in your reads, right? So Badger supports separating that. Um, Badger supports serializable snapshot isolation. What it means is you do a commit and the next transaction which does a read will be able to see that commit. You do a write and then you do a read so that the next read will be able to see the write. Um, we support compression encryption. We have, I think, two compression algorithms and multiple levels of compression. We support encryption as well. So you know, the data stored on the disk will be compressed and or encrypted. Um, Badger is being used by a lot of projects. Um, one of the most famous one is DGraph. Other ones include Jaeger Tracing, Talaria DB, Go IPFS, and others. Um, so um, we have some basic operations on Badger. You have your open, you have your set and get. So you do a transaction set, you do a batch write that set, and you have a transaction get, and then you have iterators to read this. So I'm going to quickly show a code example about how you do these operations. So um, is this readable? Um, yes, looks good. <clears throat> okay. Um, so here what I do is, it's just a simple Badger program. What I do is I open a Badger instance. We use the default options, we open a badger, and then this is how you get a DB. And then what we do over here is, this is how you create a transaction. So this is a transaction, the true parameter implies that this is a read write transaction. So you open a new transaction, you do a set. Um, this check function just checks for error cases. That's all it does. So you do a set and then you do a commit, which means you just store your data. So um, badger accepts byte slices, so your all keys and values should be in bytes. Uh, so I did a write over here, transaction one does a write, and then there's a transaction two, which tries to just read the same key from the DB. We expect here that the same, the B val would be read when you try to read the same thing back. So a transaction is a simpler way to do gets and sets, but let's say you have, you want to insert a lot of data in Badger. In that case, we have something called as write batch. It's ideally a wrapper around the transactions, but this allows us to do transactions at a much higher speed, so higher speed. So the same thing, I just insert, if you see over here, we are doing a set over here, I'm inserting what, 50,000 entries? Yes, I think it's, yes, 50,000. I insert 50,000 entries, I delete, 50, I delete 1,000 entries, and then I just call flush to ensure everything is saved inside the DB. And then what I do over here is, um, you have two ways of reading data from Badger. One is the transaction get API, and there's something called as iterator. Iterator essentially allows you to iterate through all the keys, all the keys, right? So here what I do is I just create a new iterator. This db dot view is nothing special. It just creates a new read-only transaction. It just creates, you see this one, it just creates a new read-only transaction. Okay. It creates a new read-only transaction and we created a new iterator on that. And over here, this for loop is just iterating over all the key values to key value pairs in the DB and we are just counting it over here. So nothing special in this. I'm just gonna quickly run this one and show you. So if I run this, it says inserted B key using set, we did the same get, and then we inserted 50,000 entries, we deleted 1,000 of them, and then iterator found 4,000, uh, 49,001. So this one is because the B key is also there, and we had deleted 1,000, so that's why it becomes 49,001 entry. So nothing special, we are just simple get set operations on Badger. Um, any but questions on what I've shown so far? Yeah, I had a question actually. So I noticed in some places you call dot cancel, some places you call dot discard, yes. some places you call dot uh, flush. 
Yes, a close flush. Yeah. So um, what's the difference and what's the naming convention? Right. So in transactions, we have a discard. Even if you don't call discard, this discard would be called by commit. So when you start a transaction, you're supposed to either discard it or commit it. If you try to close a Badger DB with a running transaction, it wouldn't complain. Um, Badger is fine that if you have a running transaction and you have not closed it, but ideally you would want to discard or commit it so that whatever changes you have done in your transaction is being saved. Um, for write batch, so you have something you, like so you're doing a dot commit, uh, running dot discard after that doesn't panic, is it? It just, it just kind of no, it doesn't panic. So commit would do, and this would have a discard, which says, you see, it's, if it's already discarded, you don't do anything. So this is usually the convention. If you, if you create a transaction, you would create a defer discard that as soon as this, whenever this code completes, just discard it. Even if I've forgotten to commit it, this is a safer way of doing it. Um, let's go to write batch. Write batch has this flush call. Um, this flush essentially calls commit internally. There's no such naming convention um, for write batch. Flush would make more sense because you have already committed. You are just trying to pose it to the disk. These iterators, yes, iterator has a close. Um, whenever you open an iterator, you're supposed to close. If you have unclosed iterators, Badger would complain. Badger would panic if there's a if you try to do a discard. If let's say I open this one, right? Like let's say this db.view opened a transaction inside over here. And here's a differ. If I remove this differ, no, not differ. Let's say if I just So if I go back and if I remove this one, so let's say I don't close my iterator, right? And if I run the same program, Badger would complain that there's an unclosed iterator. You see this one, it says unclosed, unclosed iterator at the time of transaction of discard. So um, you're supposed to close every iterator you open. Does that answer your question, Pages? Yes, I think that definitely does. Um, um, I have a question. So what's the reason that write patch is much faster than just doing normal right. sets? So um, when you do a transaction, the what we do is every, um, let me go to write batch. Yes. And, and, so and what happens is coming to any of these answers in, in future slides, that that's also fine. Um, no, these are not the future slides. <laughs> so let me quickly explain what write batch does. Write batch essentially starts a number of go routines. If you see the 16, this means at any given point, if you're just inserting bulk data, you would have 16 transactions running at the same time. So when you insert something in transaction, you call commit. Commit is a blocking call. If you go back to commit, let me quickly show you what commit does. Okay, so if I go to commit, commit is a blocking call. Commit does something. You see over here, there's a function of commit and send. It just prepares your entry and sends it somewhere. And then over here, we have uh, okay, commit then send, sends you this. Um, if you see over here, we did something, we figured out the commit timestamp, we processed the entries, blah, 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 and then we push the entries. Yeah, we, yeah, see this one, this one sends it to the right path, as in start writing this entry. And then this callback, this callback waits for the entry to be returned to the disk. This request.wait does not complete until we have returned the entry in the LS entry and the value log file. But this means this, if you're inserting too many entries and one entry in each transaction, you would wait for each entry to be returned to the disk and only then you'd start the next, next transaction. What write batch does is write batch, it still uses the transactions, but it does not wait for them to complete. So if you go to commit, right, write batch as a commit, if you go to commit, yeah, this one commit, if you go over here, if you notice what it, this does, it's, it's doing a transaction commit, but it's giving a callback that whenever you complete this transaction, call this, call back and do not wait for it to complete. But this means is when you're inserting something, you are no longer waiting for all the commits to complete. The commit would still happen, but you're just not waiting for them. And when you call flush, flush waits for all these commits to complete. If you look at this part, this throttle.finish, throttle is again a library which we use to um, uh, limit the number of routines running and wait for them to finish. So this throttle.finish essentially means that we wait for all the commits to complete, all the transaction commits have to be completed before we return from this flush call. That's why write batch is much faster. And does it also do some patching internally before writing to disk somewhere? Yes. Or yes. So each speak? transaction has an internal limit, right? As in uh, maximum, let's look at certain entry, right? Quickly look at certain entry. So each transaction has a limit on what you can, how much data you can add to it. So if you look at this code, this is write batch set entry. If you notice over here, we are doing a set entry. And if the set entry returns that this transition is too big, we commit it 
and then we re-add the entry. If this if the set entry returns nil, we just return back from yes. I added it to my transaction. I just went back. That's nothing to be done. But if if we cross a limit, then yes, commit it and then re-add that entry and then move on. Okay, I have a slightly uh, we have a question sort of um, related and based on this. Um, so obviously, all uh, you you mentioned that this is sitting on the server, right? So at the end of the day, this is hitting the file system, right? So yes. I, I'll give you three scenarios, right? In scenario mm -hmm. one, you do write batch and you write a thousand entries. Okay. Mm -hmm. In scenario two, you open one transaction, call um, writing um, you know a thousand entries, and then commit the transaction at the end. Mm -hmm. And in scenario three, you open up um, one thousand transactions serially. In each transaction, you write one entry and you commit. Okay. Okay. So okay, obviously the performance characteristics of these three will be. Uh, in what I described from fastest to slowest, but finally what's, mm -hmm. what gets written to the hard disk, is that the same in all three cases or will that also be different in each of these cases? Um, in separate transactions, we, with transactions, we have something called a transaction marker, right? Because on disk, we need to figure out which entries are part of one transaction. So if you're inserting single entry in a transaction, you would have two times the number of things being written to the disk. As in when you insert one entry, we will insert a finish marker because that transaction has only one entry. So there would be more things being written to the disk. Number of write calls would be still the same, but the number of the amount of data being returned to the disk would be more in single transactions. Um, in case of your a transaction which has a, a bulk data in it and write batch would have same amount of data, considering that there's only one transaction, right? If there's one trans, they would have same amount. That's, that's what I'm trying to say. Would it just be same yeah. amount or would it be byte for byte uh, identical also? Yes, it would be identical byte by byte. Because write batch would do nothing. It just, all it knows about is a transaction. So when you call write batch, it would internally give it to a transaction and do whatever you want to do with it. And it would call commit and then the transaction would again take hold of it. So write batch does not do anything special with it. But the difference would be in case when you're writing, your write batch crashes, right? So you would have only the transactions which have been committed. So that's why in write batch, you need to wait until flush happens. The flush call is your guarantee that whatever you're inserting is written to the disk. And commit is what you have with the with transactions. Make sense? Yep, that's all the questions I had at this part. Anyone else? Um, let's move on. I have some more things to show. Maybe you can go back to the questions at the end. Okay, so these are basic operations. Now, uh, these are the operations a normal project would use, but we have some other uh, advanced operations as well. For instance, we have something called a stream framework. Stream framework is what, what we use in DGRAPH as well. This is what you use to pull data out of Badger. Let's say you have a Badger DB which has 100 GB of data and you want to create a copy of it. Um, you could just create a normal operation. You read something and you do a write, but that read write would be very expensive as it, it would read one entry, again, write one entry and it would be very slow. So to circumvent that, we have something called the stream framework. Stream framework essentially does nothing special than just iterating over all the data simult uh, at the same time. We, we start 16 transactions and they just start spitting out all the key values. So we have a bunch of APIs on stream framework, which you can use to then store data. And then similarly, we have a stream writer. So stream framework is used to pull data out. Stream writer is used to write data. So the stream framework is used in backups. So when you do a badger backup, right? We call us, we, we start the stream framework, it starts spitting out key value pairs, and then we just write them to a disk. Similarly, stream writer can use such a file, as in uh, stream writer can take an input as a file which has sorted key value pairs, and then just start a Badger DB. So it does things smartly, you don't, it does not follow the right path. It knows that this data is sorted, that it would, it, it understands that this is a sorted data, I just need to push it into the LSM brief. So these two are very faster compared to the write batch or transaction or whatever we saw. And we use this at a lot of places in Tgraph. Um, so this is bulk reading writing. And then we have two transaction management modes. So um, then what you saw, right? What we saw right now, this, this, right? Oh, this one, we didn't do anything special, right? I just opened a Badger DB and I started doing transactions. So by default, this works in the normal mode or we can call it unmanaged mode. What this means is all the transactions, uh, when you do commit, when you do whatever, all these transactions are handled by Badger. Uh, we have some internal things. We have MVCC, which takes care of how these timestamps and things should be dealt with, but Badger deals with it as in the user does not have to care about it. Um, we have another mode called manage mode. In this manage mode, um, the user has to provide the commit and read timestamp. And dgraph runs in managed mode as in 
when you do a commit right you have to tell me that commit this entry at this time stamp when you want to read something you tell me that read this entry at this time stamp and it's very important for dgraph to do that right dgraph uh, the way dgraph stores data it relies on manage mode it reads a bunch of entries and discards it, it figures out which entries should be discarded so these are two more this relies on mvcc we have read timestamp commit timestamp so maybe i can give a talk about that as well but it's a complete talk in itself as in how do you do reads how do you do writes with that so that's what uh, that those are the two kind of transactions we have in um, badger any questions when do we use managed mode um manage mode is an, is used when you know that there's a specific amount of keys you, you don't want badger to discard as in let's say you want to insert an entry at some odd, odd time stamp maybe you updated something right let's say you did some batch operation you want to update an entry but you don't want it to be the latest one this is what dgraph does dgraph runs up an uh, dgraph reads up stale data processes it there's something called as roll up right we do roll up you process that data and then you write that data at an older time stamp which implies that this is old data this is not new so that's when uh, you would use manage mode manage mode would not be used by normal users it would only be when you are building a database or some complex service usually you would just use normal mode you would not care about those time stamps okay uh, moving on so in badger we have four kinds of files four simple kinds of files so there's one called sst it's called is a sorted string table it's nothing special it's just blobs of sorted data you have key value and there's an index at the end of the file um, we have some other meta information as well at the end of the file um, we have the value lock file value lock file is a write ahead lock so when you your entry comes in you be first write it to the value lock file and then insert in the lsm tree value lock file is also the val uh, sorry the value storage so i said right that we can separate keys and values so when you have bigger values let's say you have one mb of value right so that one mb of value would be returned only to the value lock file the lsm tree or the sst would just have a pointer saying that this value is stored in this file so that's what value lock file is uh, we have a key registry file the key registry file is used only for encryption so if you have encryption enabled we will need to store information right that which files are encrypted with what key what key ids are being used in all this is stored in key registry file a um, manifest file serves as the um, central point of information about all the files as in it stores information that which sst files are stored in which level of lsm tree we will we'll, we'll look at lsm tree next um, so and that information has to be stored somewhere so manifest file stores that manifest is used only when you open db and when compaction or some of the tables are being changed that's all that's why that's the use of manifest file um any questions on this uh, i had a question so like um, so actually um, this is partly related to the previous slide as well um you mentioned that the um, the uh, time stamp is done by a central oracle is that yes. sort of running in the process or is it actually safe to uh, run two different badger I mean, two different processes both running with badger uh, in the same db directory um you cannot open two uh, two badger instances pointing to a same badger directory um part one is we acquire a lock on the directory so if you if there's a second open call on the same directory it would complain um another part is even if it weren't if it weren't to complain you run into issues when you're trying to do writes right this oracle is specific to one each badger instance so db1 let's say db1 db2 db1 has its own oracle db2 has its own oracle so these time stamp could conflict with them so ideally you cannot open we have a flag which allows you to bypass it but by default you cannot open two Uh, badger instances point to the same directory got it okay so yeah so okay so you, um, so you're saying that the um, the sst file um, only contains the the keys it, it, it uh, you're saying the sst file does not have values or it's optional optional so we have something called the value threshold it's in badger options right value threshold is i think by default at 128 bytes so if your key if your value is less than 128 bytes it's stored in the sst if it's let's say 1 mb or maybe 129 bytes then we would store the the well, value would already be in the val because uh, on the vlog file because it's right hand log all you would do is we just we would just store the offset and the file id that the value for this key lies in that vlog file at that offset got it and 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 these keys uh, because these keys are byte arrays these keys mm -hmm. also could be like you know you could have a key that's like you know 500 mb in right so do we do anything to make the keys also smaller or the yes, keys yes we do smaller? yes exactly um uh, we do some kind of we can we do prefix or uh, diff uh, yes prefix diff so what happens is let's say you have key 1 and key 2 key 1 is a a a and key 2 is a a a b 
So what we do is we take key one and then you do a diff at key two. So then you would get just B back. So let's say first key is five MB. So you would still store five MB, but the next one would be only one byte because the diff was only one byte. And these keys are arranged in blocks. So when you're reading key two, you would first go to key one and build a key two from it. So SSD file is divided into blocks. Blocks have one main key, which is not compressed or done whatever with it. And then there are other keys which are processed keys. Okay, but doesn't that mean that if I need to get to, let's say there's like, I don't know, a million keys in a single file and I need to get to the last key. Doesn't that mean I have to read everything from key one to key a million in order? No, you would read, you would read the last block. Blocks are by default 4KB. So you would, you, there's an index at the end, right? You would read that index, you would do a binary search or there's offset. I think there's a direct offset. So you read that block, you take a direct offset, you go to last block and then in last block, you do a binary search. So those blocks are sorted among themselves as well. So I understand this is the last one. It would take time, but it, it's not a serial read. We do a binary search because all this data is sorted. Even if it is sorted, uh, if, if it relies on the previous keys in the block, you have to read them, right? Yes, you have to read all of them. So that key relies in a block, a 4KB block. So even you have to read 1KB, we read the entire block. You cannot just read, let's say 10 bytes. You have to read 4KB. The minimum amount of data that we read from the system is 4KB. And then from that block, we have block iterator. That block iterator goes to the correct key and then gives you that. Okay. Okay. And so this is how you're making use of SSDs, is it? Because you're, you don't need to uh, seek across the uh, hard disk. Yes. Yes. So this uh, Badger is built on a paper, which which has does some experiment and says that if you have a SSD, random read from SSD are as good as, or maybe close to reading from memory as SSDs are much faster compared to older hard disk. So if you have, if your value stored over here, then you get a performance benefit in LSM tree because your tree becomes smaller. The operations you do on the tree, they reduce and you you get a performance benefit over there. And this also means that every, that not every block would be completely used. Like you might have enough keys to fill up, I don't know, three and a half KB. Uh, and the next key that comes in is like one KB big, which means that you have to basically the first block, you just leave that space uh, blank and you need to create another block in, under that. Is that right? Yes, yes, yes. If it, if it goes beyond four KB, it's configured as well. But if let's say you have four KB and it, it does not fit in four KB, there will be a new block for it. Okay, um, so this is the last part of my uh, presentation. So we talk about what LSM tree is, right? Badger relies on LSM tree. That's, it's the internal data structure, which allows us to do reads, writes, and all the iterations. So imagine an LSM tree as a pyramid. Pyramid has a tip and then it, it keeps on increasing, right? The tip is your in-memory actively being modified data structure. And then after that tip, you have things written on the disk. So that in-memory tip of the pyramid, we call it the skip list. It's a link list which uh, which allows you to do um, reads in uh, logarithmic time, right? It allows you to do a sort of a fast search on it. So imagine it as a blob of memory in which you do reads, writes. When this blob fills up, we do we call flush on it, and that entire blob is then flushed to a disk, and we build a SST out of it. So we have first part which is called skip list to which your writes are done, and then once a skip list fills up, we push it down in the LSM tree, which means we build an we build a SSD file out of it and write it to the disk. And these SSD files are uh, uh, are immutable. You once you just build the SSDs once and you do not modify them. You would destroy them and build new ones, but the one which is written to the disk will not be modified ever again. So um, so if you look at this, um, if you look at the diagram, right? So in memory is a skip list. If you read something or write something, it goes over there. Let's say you want to read some very old data, then skip list would not have it then your reader, your read interface would go then to the LSM tree, then to the next levels of the LSM tree and try to find them. We have a hierarchy of iterators. We have um, level iterators. We have, I think, table iterators. Table have uh, block iterators. And those all those iterators make their way to the key. So when you do seek on a key, a bunch of iterators would be active and all of them would call sub iterators and they would try to go to the correct point and read the key and value for you. But that means these iterators won't necessarily um, give you keys in an ordered fashion because if you iterate through your keys, you're probably going to give you first things from in memory, then things from your first file, and then you know uh, in a in a right. So what what we do is we have something called the merge iterator. Merge iterator is the parent of all the iterators. What we do is when you start iterating, right? What I had over here, if you look at this part, oh, I had I had this iterator over here, right? 
So all I'm doing is I'm this is this iterator is giving me all data out of Badger in sequential manner, sorted by those byte size. So what happens is when I call this new iterator, right? This goes to all the levels, um, builds iterators for all the levels. It goes to skip list, builds an iterator, and now it has a bunch of iterators, right? Each level has an iterator, level iterator, has table iterator, and you have a bunch of iterators. All these would be given to something called the merge iterator. Merge iterator is you can imagine it as a heap, heap of iterators, and it just ensures that at the tip of the heap you always have the smallest key. So when you do iterate, when you do when you call next way on this iterator, this next, this next way here, you take the iterator at the top of the heap, pull the value, and then call next on it and rebalance the heap. What this means is all the iterators are always in sorted, as in tip would always give you the next bigger one, and your data comes out sorted. Okay, but in that case, if you're kind of doing it this way, wouldn't you also have to resolve um, the same key being in multiple iterators? Like for example, if you're updating it in memory and it's not yet been flushed, you probably will have a key in memory and you'll have an and you'll have the same key in a in a old um, uh, in potentially many old files because you're never updating; you're always just appending to the end. Right. So, um, in any given level, let's say uh, Badger has seven levels, right? By default, we start with seven levels. So, let's say the key relies uh, exists in your mem table one. And you have it on level one and level two as well because you inserted them sometime before. So what happens is all the versions of uh, key on level one will be together. As in, on level one there'll be only one file which has all the keys. Level two there'll be only one file which has all the keys. And then you have mem table. So you now have you now have three iterators. When you call next on it, all the three would be pointing to the start of those files. It would compare and it would say that does it exist in mem table? If yes, then pick the one in mem table and then ignore all the other ones. Got it. Depending on how your iterator is built, right? Because you just want the latest one. The latest ones are always at the top of the LSM tree. The one in L1 is newer than the one in L2. So you just pick the one from the top, and then you move all the other iterators ahead. I can show you. Uh, I can show you the merge iterator, but I think it would take a lot of time. But look at it this way: if you have if you have same keys at multiple places, we would ignore them because this iterator would give you only one version of this key. If you ask for multiple versions, then we might give it back. But if it's the same key, we would ignore it. Got it. And I see something around comp. Uh, sorry, I don't want to be the only one asking questions. I have a question on compaction, but I'll let anyone else ask first. Yeah, we, we'll be going to compaction. Next thing is compaction. So let me explain what compaction is, right? If anyone else has questions, though, like sorry, I, I think I hijacked the last uh, slides for the questions. If anyone else has, please answer them as well. <laughs> Any questions? I'll quickly take questions. If it's about compaction, compaction, I'm going to explain next. So that can wait. Okay, let's go to compaction. Um, so I said that we don't modify files, right? So let's say you have a key called foo. You insert foo twenty thousand times. What happens is um, Badger has twenty thousand different versions of that key foo, right? Because I said we do not update anything. We just we just flush it down and then it stays in that LS, uh, SST. What happens is eventually it build up a lot of data, right? And most of it would be redundant if you're just updating something. It would be redundant, and because of redund that redundant data, your reads would be slower. Because I said we have iterators, right? The iterator goes to redundant data. It says that this is the old one. I just want the new one, and all those things happen, right? So there's this process on compaction. What compaction does it? It picks up a bunch of tables and then combines them to form a new table. So let's say you have level L and you have level L plus one. Level L plus one. Uh, when compaction happens on these two levels, it would pick a range. Let's say you have data from A to Z. This compaction picks up range A to C. Let's say it would pick all the tables with that A to C and then combine them and push them. To the next level, and while doing this process, we have some filters, right? That how many number of versions do you want to keep? Which keys have been deleted? All these, and all these would this would remove all the redundant data, all the unnecessary data. And next level, L1 would have only the useful data. So if you see in the diagram, we have three tables. They got combined, but some of the data was deleted or discarded. So on the next level, we just have the valid data. This means that we reduce the amount of data, and this means. That our reads would be a little bit easier compared to what we had earlier. Does it make sense? Any questions about this? Okay, so this was LSM tree compaction. We have something called as value log garbage collection. I said that value log is a while, right? You keep writing things that added to it. But what would happen is, let's say you've been running it for a day, you would end up with a bunch of files, right? So to clean that up, we have Value log GC. Value log GC is, uh, does a lot of things. It tries to read data from the file, figures out which ones are valid. If they are valid, it would move them from one file to another. It has to fix the LSM tree as well, right? Because I said that 
the LSM trees are not modified. The SSTs are not modified, right? So if you have an older key which points to the file which is being garbage collected, you have to fix those pointers as well. So we do some smart things over there to fix those pointers. And then you have to remove the old ones, uh, ensure the right ones are at the top of the tree, all those things. So this is what value log GC does. There's an API for calling value log GC as well. Um, this is all I had for this sort of presentation. If you have any questions, I can answer those now. Okay, I think we don't have any questions. I'm gonna stop sharing now. Awesome, thanks Ibrahim. I think that was uh, that that was pretty awesome. At least I know that I'm. Uh, it's you know very helpful for me. I don't know if the rest of you already uh, had a lot of context on this.